makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. The U.S. Treasury 30-year yield touches 5% for the first time since 2007, with the global bond sell-off spilling over into other markets. Testing 150 while the yen spikes, Japanese officials refuse to say whether they intervened to bring stability in the FX markets. Plus, a fresh turmoil in Washington as Kevin McCarthy becomes the first ever U.S. House Speaker to be removed from from his post, increasing the odds of a U.S. government shutdown. So we have a busy day. It's certainly a busy markets day. So let's go through straight away what the European markets are telling us. A lot of focus, of course, on treasuries and what that means for uh, the spread of this financial around. Now, the sell-off in U.S. treasuries extended a third straight day. There's more and more conviction growing that U.S. interest rates could rise further from the current 22-year highs. The 10-year treasury yield is also looking set to hit the 5% threshold. This is key, especially psychologically. Now, here in Europe, we're seeing uh, tentative markets. We're also getting some euro area September services PMIs, and that's at 48.7, a touch above expectations, but also anything below 50 still means a contraction. Now, this is a picture across the board for some of the things that we're looking at in bond markets. It's very clear that investors are demanding ever higher compensation to hold some of this uh, long dated debt. This is after major central banks have made it clear that they were unlikely to ease policy anytime soon. Of course, some of these concerns of also increased treasury issuance um, because of swelling budget deficits could weigh on these longer securities for much longer volatility spilling into equities and spreading to corporate notes. So for on this bruising week for Treasuries. Bloomberg's Valerie Titel joins us. And Valerie, I guess the question is, for how much longer? Uh, exactly, Francine. For how much longer will we see this bear steepening of the Treasury curve? This move in yields that's led by the long end has captured our attention uh, for so much of the last few weeks. But I want to show you just how stretched this move is. This is the 30-year yield versus its 200-day moving average. We are now trading nearly a percentage point above the 100-day moving average, which just goes to show that this momentum has really, really surprised all of us just how uh, 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 quickly and uh, jarringly these yields have risen in just the last few weeks alone, Francine. So what can you tell us about Europe? I mean, Europe's also not being spared. Uh, this bond market rattling is going global, that is for sure. Not only are we seeing this move in the long end of the Treasury yield, but we're also seeing German bonds uh, make some statistics as well. We had the 10-year German bond cross the 3% handle for the first time since 2011, just this morning. And then it is also hitting Asia, Japan, JGBs, rising above 80 basis points for the first time in over a decade. We also saw other parts of the JGB curve rattled as well, the five-year yield and the 30-year yield. But I want to talk a little bit more about this German uh, yield move as well. Uh, if we look at what's happened in the yield curve, uh, there was a time in this morning session where we actually saw an uninversion of the curve. We saw those 30-year yields trade above the two-year yields very briefly. We have bounced from that, uh, but it is notable that this steepening, this uninversion pressure has gone global, Francine, and it is hitting Europe as well. Valerie, thank you so much. Valerie Titel there with a roundup of what we're seeing across bond markets. Now joining us now is Virginie Maisonneuve, Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Allianz Global Investors. Virginie, with all, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. With all of your years of experience, this seems like a pretty remarkable week when you look at, at fixed income and the sell-off in global bond markets. What will break, Virginie? I think you have to, to step back and reflect a little bit. Uh, there's potentially two really important factors. One is the, uh, I would say, market um, encompassing the higher for longer. Uh, and we've been in that camp for a while. So frankly, it's a little bit surprising that there's such a big reaction where we felt there was a lot of indication that that should be the case. The second one is really thinking about what's happened in the US yesterday. And if, in fact, higher rates are potentially over the, the rest of the week reflect a risk off in light of this chaos that we see in Washington. And my next question would be, how does that impact the elections? 
of course, a, a more volatile Washington, a more divided Washington, uh, probably plays in the hands of some of the uh, candidates better than others. So I think we'll have to divide that. The next question is, what is the impact of the steepening of the curves onto recession odds and inflation? And of course, there are uh, the main uh, criteria is how long will we see those rates stay high? So I think those are the key questions to make sure that we're positioned uh, properly in the equity portfolios. So, uh, Virginie, again, we've seen quite a lot of volatility, and, and I want to ask you whether you worry about, for, for example, you know, a, a Treasury issuance to fund some of these swelling deficits and what that means in terms of volatility, you know, also for your world, so corporate notes and equities. Yeah, so really interesting. We've done a lot of work on, on debt inequities. And what we found is that actually large cap generally uh, as fixed, if you look at Europe and, and the U.S., has fixed 75 percent of non-financial uh, corporate debt is fixed. So actually many of the large cap companies benefit from higher rates. That's, of course, very different if you look at the, the smaller cap uh, stage or, or you know, uh, ecosystem or companies who have business models that are not as strong. So for us, it's really about whatever the style that you're in, uh, quant, uh, growth, uh, value, income, you want to be in the quality space of those styles because until we go through that storm and we'll get through that storm, uh, you want to, to have a lot of diversification as well as a lot of quality in the portfolio. But uh, Virginie, could we actually see a correction in equities just because of this financial route if it doesn't stop in the next couple of days? I think we could have, and this this would be, you know, normal, what I would call, you know, volatility expected in Q4. Uh, I think if you believe that those uh, that that next rate increase or that steepening is not only due to inflation, sticky or resilience, so good news is bad news if you want in the U.S., but also to a risk mm -hmm. of factor, then you should use that uh, volatility to add and position portfolios if you don't have uh, uh, what you need in your portfolios. But I think it's fair to say that uh, there's going to be a volatile environment until we have more clarity. How much, and again, you laid this out, that we could see because of you know tightening in financial market conditions, we could have some logical negative consequences. But could it actually impact some of the larger caps that have so far been okay in refunding? I don't know whether, Virginie, at this point, we need to also look at worst case scenario or whether that's premature. Yeah, I think it's premature. I think you go back to bottom up case by case, right? So you've had, for example, a derating uh, versus the general market of tech by about 20%. Well, actually, some of the fundamentals for tech have improved. Again, it depends on your time horizon. If you have a long term time horizon, which you know investors should have, you should look through those and find those stocks that have very strong structural backing. That's number one. Uh, for growth, right, and that quality balance sheet. The other thing is look for areas that are really oversold. And again, if you look at China, for example, that's the consensus, uh, you know, negative. Well, actually, the PMI numbers that came out yesterday were, in my view, quite encouraging and certainly in the line of what we're expecting in terms of the transformation of this economy. Yes, uh, real estate and property is still an issue. But if you look at the strength of the new sectors, digital economy, green economy, and the PMIs for that, that was actually quite strong. Uh, and, and so we have that transformation taking place. Uh, on, is there a danger, and again, Virginie, we're kind of putting everything together because everything seems linked. Uh, we also have, you know, the ousting of the House Speaker in the U.S. This is the first time it's happened. I don't know whether that will translate into foreign policy possibly as a harder line to China, and so that, that also changes supply chain. Yeah, this is important, of course. So I think the first, uh, we know what the uh, dilemma or the, point, the contentious point was, which was Ukraine the U.S. borders, uh, clearly depending on who wins the next U.S. election, uh, you know, the posturing or the attitude towards China could be quite dramatically different. 
in any case, we know China phase three. Uh, remember, we've talked about this China geopolitical stage, uh, you know, geopolitical power has changed, has evolved. Digital Darwinism competition uh, for the top spots uh, through technology, that is going on. So whomever comes in Washington, uh, those themes will remain. Virginie, thank you so much as always. Virginie Maisonneuve, Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Alliance Global Investors, stays with us and we'll talk about sector specific issues. Now, Kevin McCarthy, as we were just hearing, has been toppled as U.S. House Speaker by dissidents within his own party. It ends his tumultuous nine months in the job and sending a fractious Congress into further disarray. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Derek Wallbank. Derek, this feels huge, but it's also unclear what happens next, apart from concerns about a government shutdown. Yeah, Francine, I think that's a really great tie-in to make there, right? Uh, the proximate thing that ended Kevin McCarthy's time as Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives after just a couple months was a stopgap spending bill for a month and a half at spending levels that had already been negotiated. Now, if that sounds like a very little deal, that's because it is. It is not a remarkable piece of legislation, but McCarthy going forward on it over the objections of someone on his right flank was the proximate thing that caused a uh, motion to vacate, which it should be recalled, uh, McCarthy had given these folks the re on the rest of right uh, an easier way to try and topple him as a sort of carrot to put him in in the first place. Uh, this was the method by which he was he was taken out. Now, it does put in a lot of questions here, chief among them the mid-November deadline that you referred to, which, which I think is exactly the way to think about this. The, I think the base case scenario that a lot of people had made walking into the shutdown showdown weekend uh, last weekend was that they thought that there was going to be a shutdown of some margin. McCarthy changed that dynamic because he said, actually, mm -hmm. we're going to pull out from this. We're going to go forward. And, uh, and, 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 and sort of save the day. Well, he's lost his job now. So what does that do yep. to your base case? The second thing I want to make, make a point about real quick, and uh, Virginie was mentioning this about Ukraine. If there was, right. there was some language about what was going to happen with Ukraine funding, Kevin McCarthy's not there. Whatever deal you cut with him, the guy you cut a deal with doesn't exist anymore as the, in terms of the person who can bring bills forward. Derek, thank you so much. Derek Wellbank there, of course, on the ousting of the House Speaker. We'll have plenty more throughout the day on U.S. politics and what that means for the ramifications going forward. Coming up, the Fed's Raphael Bostic backs holding interest rates high for a long time. So we'll discuss that next. And this is Blue Bank. I'm very optimistic about the U.S. economic outlook. Short term, um, inflation is coming down in the context of an extremely strong labor market. We're now engaging in a very substantial program of investments to strengthen our economy. Well, that was the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen giving her thoughts on the U.S. economic outlook. Now, the Treasury Secretary also cast doubt over whether a resilient economy would force rates to stay elevated for a long period, saying it's by no means a given. That's in contrast to the Atlanta Fed President, Rafael Bostic, who says the U.S. should hold rates for, in his words, a long time to bring down inflation. So let's bring back Virginie Maisonneuve, Global Equity Chief Investment Officer at Alliance Global Investors. Virginie, thank you so much for staying with us. I guess a, a long time or a very long time, it's unclear what that means. When do you think we'll see the first Fed cut? Well, I think we have to see what oil prices do. And as you know, that supply uh, constraints more as well as this ongoing risk off that we're seeing. But assuming that you have uh, continuing disinflation signs, I think that within, you know, four to five months, we could be looking at uh, rate discussions again. Uh, I think the supply, uh, you know, on the bond market that you mentioned uh, earlier on is a very important factor as well. So the key for us is to understand how much that long bond uh, increase in rate is going to impact the companies that we have and make sure that we're positioned very carefully in quality stocks, 
in the different styles that we have, as well as a bedrock of multi-factor or if you want very diversified portfolios to be able to have ammunition to buy in that volatility that we will see over the next few months. So, Virginie, how much of the third quarter earnings could be a catalyst for potential buying? And again, you lay it out you know, beautifully, very simply, to understand the, the source of volatility and what that means, for example, in, for example, being very careful to construct your portfolio. Yeah, I think you'll see. So you could see, you know, companies like the tech sector has derated quite a bit. Uh, you still have very strong underpinning uh, in tech. And if you see when you have those earnings, you know, uh, some long term plans and support for growth while the stocks come back on this risk aversion, those are names that you should look at. Right. And this is the same across most of the sectors, I would say. Uh, generally, when you have risk off, you know, everything goes goes down and this is when you have a very good fishing ground uh, but you have to do all the bottom work work in a lot of detail. So Virginie overall are you adding to tech for example it's you know valuations in certain parts of technology are falling I don't know whether you still think it's too expensive. So I think for us, it depends. You know, we have AI products, we have tech products, we have cyber products, et cetera. Uh, depending if you're a growth uh, style, an income or a value style, you know, uh, it, it, each each team and each portfolio manager clearly will do their own work. But I would say mm -hmm. that, you know, in the growth space and clearly in our tech strategies, uh, we, we will be looking to, to bottom fish, right, if the valuations mm -hmm. uh, come to the right level. Virginie, as always, thank you so much for all of your insights. Virginie Maisonneuve there from Allianz Global Investors. Now, coming up, black and blue, we discuss the drivers behind the bruising week for treasuries and global bonds next. This is Bloomberg. Now, the global bond route is deepening as the higher for longer narrative sinks in. 30-year Treasury yields have hit 5% for the first time since 2007. The pain has spread to equities. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Sofia Ortai costa from our Markets Today blog. So, Sofia, I mean, what a day, right, for markets. It's kind of bruised across the board without anything really happening. So it's almost like a sudden realization that th this will be higher for longer. What's the end game? Like, what could break? Yeah, exactly. I think the moves, um, it, it, you know, it's, it is kind of beginning of the quarter. Um, markets are clinging on to a new narrative. They were looking for a new narrative, and it, this seems to be the higher for longer one, even though, um, as you mentioned earlier on the show, Janet Yellen is saying this is not a given by no means. There's still a lot of factors at play here. Um, but it's really, really spreading, starting on the long end, and that's essentially looking ahead to the long-term um, economic picture um, where inflation will be persistent. You're getting that really priced in. Investors want to demand more um, for holding these longer dated bonds. And, and the fact is, you know, whatever treasuries do, you'll see that move the gilt market, you'll see that move um, uh, the euro, whatever's happening in the euro area as well, um, really looking at the, long, the, the round numbers that we're hitting almost every single day. I am looking at the 30-year gilt market, um, Francine, because yep. we're very, very close to surpassing those levels reached last year during the, the trust era crisis, market crisis. But it's really, markets are panicking. Um, I, I have, re but I wonder, is, it, is this part, I mean, they're panicking, but it's unclear. Is this also because they worry about issuance? So we have these like ballooning deficits that they'll have to plug. And does it make sense for it to happen now? Or could it have, could it have happened two weeks from now? They are worried about issues. There's also, I mean, if you just kind of zoom out, central banks are no longer buying bonds, right? They're, they're, they're selling. So you're, you're seeing, yeah. um, you know, at a time when actually the global bond market, global government bond market is enormous. Um, you're seeing more issuance at a higher level. We did see actually uh, two deals pulled uh, yesterday that was on, on the corporate side. But when you do have the demand supply dynamics really kind of shift and you don't have central banks as a buyer of last resort, that really um, kind of uh, puts, this, puts things into perspective. I would say, Francine, if you're looking for the one thing to break, look at the credit market. Yeah. Uh, ING has a really good note out this morning. Why are equity markets so concerned about this move uh, higher in yields, it's because this is a tax on borrowers. So 
uh, unlike inflation, which uh, companies can kind of pass on to consumers through higher prices, mm -hmm. they can't pass on the cost of higher borrowing. So this is really a key theme going into mm -hmm. earnings season. Um, you know, which companies... Uh, are, will be under pressure from higher borrowing costs, and this is what's concerning um, uh, equity markets, and that's why we're seeing all of that kind of ripple yep. through the world. And, and of course, this has huge implications. If you're a politician, you were just mentioning the 30-year the guilts. I mean, we, we're healed for, from Rishi Sunak a little bit later, and, and it could if not make or break his election, certainly something else that he needs to deal with. And then watch out for maybe some of the uh, more concerning periphery countries. I'm thinking of Italy and, and the spread between BTPs and, for example, German bonds. Mm, exactly, especially if this, these moves have kind of very little to do with what's actually happening on the ground in these economies. Uh, I mean, if we focus on the UK, uh, actually Jeremy Hunt, will, the Chancellor, will today receive its first, his first draft from the OBR of economic forecasts ahead of the budget and autumn statement. And we know that there's very, very little wiggle room over what he can do and, you know, tax, tax cuts are off the table. So it does kind of complicate policy because markets are so concerned and really kind of, um, you know, anything can, can speak them right now. Sophia, thank you so much. Sofia Arta Ecosta there from our Markets Today blog. Now, coming up, we'll speak to the UK Defence Secretary. This comes as the Prime Minister prepares for what could be one of the biggest speeches of his career today. This is Bloomberg. Now, the U.S. Treasury 30-year yield touches 5% for the first time since 2007, with the global bond sell-off spilling over into other markets. Testing 150, the yen spikes. The Japanese officials refuse to say whether they intervened to bring stability in the FX market. Plus, fresh turmoil in Washington as Kevin McCarthy becomes the first ever U.S. House Speaker to be removed from his post, increasing the odds of a U.S. government shutdown. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, here in the UK, the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is also taking centre stage at the Conservative Party conference today for what is shaping up to be the biggest speech of his political career. Well, one of. Uh, overshadowing the conference are questions over whether he will scrap part of the HS2 high-speed rail project, the UK's biggest infrastructure investment program. Well, Mark Reynolds, the chief executive of Contractor Mace, which is working on the project, says he hopes the government reconsiders. This undermines massive amount of confidence in UK PLC. The fact that the government aren't willing to invest in actually what is the spine of a rail network of providing low carbon, high speed connectivity through the country. Well, our UK correspondent Lizzie Burden now joins us from, uh, of course, the conference with a cabinet minister. Lizzie, over to you. Thanks, Francine. Yes, I'm joined by the UK Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, about to head off to a Cabinet meeting. Thank you for making time for me. Uh, you are a former Transport Secretary as well as now Defence. We're expecting in the Prime Minister's speech later today an announcement on HS2. Mm. Why should investors believe in long-term decisions for a brighter future from the Conservatives when it appears that today a long-term plan is going to be scrapped because of short-term pressures? Uh, because of coronavirus, which is a very long-term. I mean, last time we had a uh, pandemic like that was over 100 years beforehand. I had hoped, as Transport Secretary in particular, that we would see a return to people to the railway, this railway in particular. Uh, I noted checking the figures this week, uh, we've only got 69% uh, of passengers have come back. Uh, it's way down on, on where it was on this line before coronavirus and I think eventually you have to look at a project that costs tens of billions of pounds as the Prime Minister I know has been doing and say actually is that the best way to spend tens of billions of pounds or are there other things you could do? Just to clarify though, I've seen quite a lot of commentary on this, there would still be high-speed trains pulling into Manchester, they'd be faster on the first section of the track but even that second section of the track over a period of time receives upgrades including things like digitising the signalling which speeds up the journey as well. So the Prime Minister is prepared to take difficult, sometimes not immediately popular decisions, uh, but in order to do the right thing, perhaps spend that money elsewhere and get to a brighter future. Well, the Tory West Midlands Mayor Andy Street says that if that second leg of HS2 is scrapped, it's really going to scar the UK's international uh, reputation among investors. Has the government had talks with Andy Street, given that there are fears he could resign? So, look, first of all, 
the idea that the world changes, coronavirus, people don't travel anymore. My, my son's 19. He was offered a, a job and took it last year, but it's a two or three days a week in the office. And those are, well, that's what's happening. You, you carry on and you pretend the world hasn't changed and carry on spending the money in that way isn't necessarily the wisest thing to do. And I think this is the thing about Rishi Sunak. He's prepared to look at the detail, actually really put his head in it and study it properly, take decisions, sometimes not popular immediately, but actually potentially good for the country. What we've heard all week is, well, that could disappear, that second part of the high-speed bit of it. What we haven't heard is what the benefits might be, and I think that's why we're looking forward to the speech today. The benefits, perhaps other things the money could be spent on. There's always a counterfactual, that's well, right. Well, the Bloomberg levelling up scorecard shows that since 2019, since Boris Johnson's election, uh, the left-behind parts of Britain have fallen further behind London and the south-east. Why should it be a choice in the north between, let's say, buses or east-west connections and high-speed rail? Well, look, uh, first of all, I haven't seen the detail of how your, uh, your index has worked out. What I do know is that we've spent, since 2010, £33 billion pounds on northern transport connectivity, roads and rail. I also know um, that the, what was called the integrated rail plan, the, the, the bit of it that connects the north together, for example, being able to get from Liverpool to Manchester, uh, to Leeds, the Hull, these are things that you know, often are talked about and forgotten in favour of, well, don't worry, we can knock another 20 minutes off this bit of a journey travelling from London. And actually the, the North deserves better than that, and, and this is a, perhaps a, a better way of thinking through that plan. You're also a former business secretary. When we've got the headroom, would you prioritise business tax cuts over workers' tax cuts? Uh, well, look, uh, those questions are for the uh, Chancellor, and he would do I all the money. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he'll tell you, come an autumn station or a budget. But... You, know, you would you run all the modelling to see what you think is going to be in the best long-term interests of a country, and that is something that, you know, again, this government is determined to do. It's always going to be popular. If you, want, if you want the sort of popularist say anything, do anything, claim anything, you've got Sakia Starmer for that. He, he'll, he'll do all of that for you. We're prepared to take the difficult decisions. All right, let's talk about the Conservatives. You're now Defence Secretary. I'm interested in the differences between you and your predecessor, Ben Wallace. Do you agree with his view that the UK shouldn't be Ukraine's Amazon for weapons? Well, look, I was actually in Ukraine, in Kyiv, last Wednesday, uh, having talks with President Zelensky. Uh, actually, he asked me to send a very important message back to the British people, which is to say a huge thank you. Britain has lent into this more than anywhere else, led the world uh, with it. You ask differences between me and Ben Wallace. I'm very committed to Ukraine. I had a Ukrainian family of three and their dog live with us for a year, uh, and I want to see a situation where Putin cannot benefit from his illegal invasion. Well, has Britain run out of stockpiled equipment to send to Ukraine? No, we haven't run out of equipment, but it is true, of course, that you have to replenish the equipment. One Are you willing the, to send new equipment? Well, 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 say one of the great things that's actually happened, and I've been talking to industry about this, is that Britain's become the first country where a, uh, a, a, com a company, BAE in this case, will actually go to Ukraine and actually uh, produce the replenishment in country, which is a very welcome development as well. Yeah, does the four billion that you're giving to BAE systems cover the costs only or do you expect them to turn a profit? Uh, so I think that's possibly from a different announcement on Sunday that I made about um, the uh, submarines. Orcas submarines uh, and that's BAE, Rolls-Royce, Babcock, primes as, 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 as they're called uh, and it lays the contracts for the first stage of what will be the Royal Navy's uh, biggest and most powerful submarines that the Royal Navy will have ever had. Okay, just going back to Ukraine, the US House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has been ousted. It clouds the outlook for US aid to Ukraine. How concerned are you that Washington isn't going to be able to restore funding before the election? I, I say this, and I, again I discussed this with uh, President Zelensky last week. There have always been concerns in different directions right from day one of this war. In fact, on day one, most commentators thought on day three, Putin would be in Kyiv and a puppet government would be installed. So, yes, of course, you think about the future and what might and could and perhaps might, may happen. Um, actually, that's been the Ukraine story all the way through. Um, we will work together, including next week when I'll go to uh, meet other NATO leaders and other what are called contact group leaders 
50 countries working to support Ukraine, so we will continue with that effort. And just finally, earlier this week you were lavishing praise on Saudi Arabia, but we understand that Mohammed bin Salman's cancelled or postponed his visit. Why is that? Can you give us more I, information? I, look, uh, visits and timetables um, change all, all the time, and I think the point you're referring to is, I was pointing out, I've been to Saudi Arabia this year, it's a country in amazing uh, social uh, and economic change, and, uh, and, and that change perhaps hasn't been recognised fully in the West, much further to go. It's not, I'm not saying that for one moment there's a liberal democratic uh, state of the type that we would recognise, but I do think that when change happens, you do have to recognise that. I don't think there's anything at all in timing of visits. Diaries often don't quite work out or, or, or and other uh, events take place, uh, but we will make sure that we're working very closely with our friends uh, throughout the Gulf, actually. Well, we'll keep an eye on that visit when it happens. Thank you, UK Defence Secretary Grant Shapps. Back to you, Francine. Lizzie, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg UK correspondent with Grant Shafts. We'll have plenty more, of course, from the Conservative Party conference throughout the day. Looking forward to that speech by the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak. Coming up, the venture capital winter is now over. That's according to Michael Furtick. He's a tech entrepreneur and he joins us next to chat VC plus the rise of AI. This is Bloomberg. All eyes turn to the U.S. job market. The jobs report, it beckons. It looks like companies are just holding on, holding on, holding on to workers. What you see is what you get. We're seeing a lot of strength. This Friday, Tom, Jonathan, Lisa, and Mike will bring you crucial data and expert analysis at terminal speed. This is exactly what the Fed is looking for. They now believe you can get back to 2% without damaging the labor market at all. We might get a bigger whammy than we expected. The September Jobs Report, Friday on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Some people may say that AI can be more dangerous than nuclear bomb. So there should be regulation, which I agree. However, don't use AI is like don't drive car or don't use electricity. Well, the SoftBank chief executive Masayoshi Son there calling on businesses to adopt AI, but for the technology to be regulated. Now let's talk tech with an entrepreneur, Michael Furtick. He's a founder of Silicon Valley VC firm Heroic Ventures and is credited with pioneering the field of online reputation management. Michael, as always, so good to speak to you. I mean, you focus on software development, basically VCs and where the money, the smart money goes. What's VC looking like in Europe right now? Great to see you. So... Last year, I said that there was a big VC winter coming in May. Yep. Uh, and now I'm declaring that VC winter is over. VC winter has been replaced by VC spring just in time of the fall. <laughs> um, it's been widely reported that something like 75 to 50 percent downdrafts have been seen in venture investment at every stage, yep. early yep. through late, yep. globally, yep. sort of geographic independent. But I now see the green shoots of what I think will be the next big wave, not just AI, but big time AI. Yep. And I'm seeing new deals happen. I'm seeing not just major recaps and pain. I'm seeing a lot of new early stage deals. And I think you'll be seeing in the next year or two in the public sphere, like on Bloomberg, reports about companies that were founded in 22, 23. And I think this is going to be, end up being one of the big vintages. So, Michael, so first of all, where's the money coming from? Is it being pulled from elsewhere and, yeah. and put into you know, early, early startup tech because we talk about AI yeah. as the next big thing? Yeah, I think it's a great question. So it's, a, it's an essential question. So right now, because the Fed is giving you basically risk-free 5%, right. all this money has been pulled from a risk on uh, asset classes like venture. So a lot of venture is not going to come back. But the core venture, the really good professional venture capitalists, are now seeing good entry points, good valuations, right? Not silly high valuations. They're getting board seats. There's governance, not the kids coming out of Stanford, 22-year-old, raising 40 million bucks with no board to, to report to. So you're seeing real healthy stuff. And this is back to, I'd say, the, the regular normal venture cycle, which is healthy, better valuations. And we're not investing in companies that were never really venture to begin with, sort of people-based businesses that are, in fact, sort of look like venture. We want to dress them up as venture. The hot topic, of course, is AI. And I do believe there is a... I've only felt this three times in my career. I thought the Internet, there was going to be a before and after. CRISPR, there was going to be a before and after. That's the gene editing stuff. And now AI, 
especially generative AI, there's a before and after. I think this is the next 10-year wave. I mean, I, I feel like when you speak to regulators or people in charge of, for example, stock markets, they're saying, you know, Europe still needs to catch up in becoming a mature market like in the U.S. where pension funds invest in VC, where they invest in, in, in tech companies. There has been things at the margin here in the U.K. that they're trying to do yeah. to get that kind of funding. Is it actually going to work? Look, I cannot advise pension funds on how they should pay attention Invest to superannuation <laughs> needs. I can, it's not what I do. But I can say that for some uh, long-term holders, an allocation to venture and private equity has been extremely lucrative. Yeah. You know, I think there is a reallocation happening, and I'm seeing it in the United States with the LP base that, with whom I work, and internationally also in Asia. I can say that perhaps some of the direct investing in, right. in startups and in private companies may need to move back to venture funds and the people who think about this all the time. Um, there may be some experts at the, at the pension funds yeah. to do this as well, but I think that the, the venture investing is probably best left to the venture yeah. investors, is my guess. But you moved to Paris. France and Emmanuel Macron has done a huge, huge you know, push to try and attract the right investors to make it a tech hub. Yes. Like, is, is Europe ever going to be a tech hub for anyone? I am bullish on the UK for a lot of reasons. I'm bullish on Eastern Europe. I'm bullish on Israel, as you know, which may or may not be part of Europe, depending on the conversation. Uh, I have a hard time getting very bullish on France for tech. I'm bullish on France for other things. I believe that France is still suffering from dirigisme, uh, the kind of the de Gaullist idea where they choose national champions. Um, France does have an early jump, surprisingly, and I think by luck and by accident, on AI. Mm -hmm. Probably about 10, 20 percent of the best AI minds in the world were trained in France. Many of them stayed in France. Mm -hmm. Uh, I might get myself in trouble with my French friends, but I don't think the French really know how to work really hard the way the Americans and others do. So I'm actually not that bullish. Also, regulation still really punishes companies that grow beyond 50 people. And that's a hard ceiling for startups to deal with. I see this with the French startups I meet. However, I can say that France does produce some enormous technical talent. Yep. And unfortunately for France, the best ones leave, they go to America, they go elsewhere, and they do very, very well elsewhere. And if France wants to succeed, they have to keep them back in France. Who will regulate AI correctly, if anyone? Well, you're asking a great question. You remember very well the privacy wars with me from years ago. I was early on the privacy jump. And, and the regulators missed privacy, yes. right? They lost, they lost the march on privacy, and they've been trying to sort of put the toothpaste back in the tube ever since, and Europe has led the way. I do think that they're, more, they're paying more attention to, to AI now. I worry that the AI regulating people will be more worried about saving jobs that are probably at risk. So now AI is going to do to white-collar jobs what yeah. software and the Internet has, have, have done to so many blue-collar jobs. Mm -hmm. Take the example, for example, maybe of auditing, which is big in the U.K., but globally. Big four employ maybe one and a half million people globally. Good, high-paying, mm -hmm. highly educated jobs. The risk is, and I think it's actually not just risk, I think it's a near guarantee over time, near guarantee over time is my guess, my prediction, that those jobs are just going to be replaced by computers. You can probably do, do with an AI very soon on a continuous auditing basis a better job than an annual human-driven audit. Michael, is this your biggest risk for AI, or is it the fact that at some point we won't really be able to tell the difference between a real picture and a fake picture? The biggest risks for AI are that the computers get smart enough to start telling us what to do or to start acting independently. That is a risk. It is a, is it a real risk? But yes, it, it's a real risk. 10, and, 15 years from now or uh, longer? It's hard to predict. These things always take a little longer and then happen much faster mm -hmm. than you predict. So they, they, they happen later, but then much faster precipitously than one predicts. I'm worried about computers uh, managing weapons. I'm worried about computers managing healthcare care choices. Um, they are not, after all, humans. They do not, after all, have souls. But they're very, 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 very smart, and they can become eventually sort of semi-self-aware. You know, even the best technologists today don't really understand how neural networks work. They somehow get smarter in a way that we don't really comprehend, but it does happen. So if that's already happening now, 2023, imagine a few years from now how stunning the progress will be. I'll tell you one thing on this point. In 2022, and I'm pretty darn good at this, I was amazed at how quickly AI was improving. And that's when I decided, okay, we got to get all in on this yep. because there's going to be yep. a before and after. So, yeah, I am but this is So this is also because of the chips, right? They get better and smarter. So is the smart money going into trying to regulate AI? Because I guess you need counter softwares. Or is it into expanding AI? Well, you bring up a very good point because some of the response to AI will be, let's say, counter intel yeah. AI, right? So, right. Right. So if you're... If Keep you're, you safe. 
Keep you safe, right. And so that, that will also happen. There'll be an industry for, for the pro and the con, the before and the after and so forth. The chip companies are doing very well. As you know, I'm not a public securities commentator, but I am a private investor yeah. in some of the most exciting companies in the chip space. I think that will come to compete at the scale of classical and compute that the NVIDIAs okay. and the AMDs already are, are in. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Michael Furtick there. Don't be a stranger. Come back really soon. The founder of Silicon Valley VC firm Heroic Ventures. Now, coming up, Sam Bankman-Fried's fall from grace will bring you the details of the crypto entrepreneur's first day in court. This is Bloomberg. The blockbuster trial of the U.S. versus Sam Bankman fried is underway almost a year after the collapse of the FTX crypto exchange he co-founded. Well, Bloomberg's Kelly Lines has more from New York. Sam Bankman frieds trial began in federal court here in Manhattan on Tuesday, where he is facing seven charges related to fraud and money laundering. The trial proceedings began with jury selection. Multiple pools of jurors were evaluated for any bias so that they ultimately can decide his fate here. Sam Bankman fried was present in the courtroom on Tuesday. He had a shorter haircut. That signature mop of curly hair is gone. He was also wearing a suit that appeared too big for him. It seems that he may have lost some weight while in detention at the Metropolitan Detention Center. Of course, this case really centers around the implosion of FTX and Alameda Research, the crypto exchange and the separate hedge fund, both of which he had founded. And prosecutors say he orchestrated one of the greatest financial frauds in U.S. history, that he misused customer funds and used them for things like risky investments, real estate, and even political donations. Prosecutors will be aided by three key witnesses, all of whom were some of Sam Bankman frieds closest associates at the time this all went down. Down. Gary Wong, the co-founder of FTX, Nishad Singh, who is FTX's head of engineering, and Caroline Ellison, his ex-girlfriend and former CEO of Alameda Research. All of them have pleaded guilty to charges and are cooperating with prosecutors. As for the defense, they will likely argue that Sam Bankman Fried did not intentionally commit fraud. This is something that Bankman Fried himself has said repeatedly in the lead up to this trial. And of course, he has pleaded not guilty to all seven of these charges. This trial, though, is going to take some time to play out. It could last up to six weeks. And if he is indeed convicted of these seven charges at the end of it, some of them carry large maximum sentences of 20 years for five of these counts. So it is very possible if he is found guilty that Sam Bankman Freed could spend the rest of his life in prison or be sentenced to it at least. Kaylee Lines at the federal courthouse in Manhattan for Bloomberg News. Of course, we'll continue following that very closely. Also, Sandoz has debuted with a $12 billion market valuation following its spinoff from Novartis. Now, the generic drugs company says it now has more freedom to pursue its own growth strategy. The chief executive officer, Richard Sainer, told Bloomberg about expansion plans. For the last seven quarters, we've delivered strong mid-single-digit growth, and that's our forward guidance. Um, clearly, my priorities over the next couple of years, maintaining that momentum in the business, executing an unrivaled biosimilar pipeline that we intend to launch both in Europe but also in North America, um, expanding the margin and then driving up the free cash within the business. But clearly, I think we're building credibility, really delighted with the filings and approvals that we've got. As we stand here today, we have something like 25 uh, biosimilars, five we intend to launch over the next couple of years, addressing about a $50 billion market opportunity. Richard Sainer there, the chief executive of Sandos. Up next, Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manus Cranley from London and New York. This is Bloomberg.